We work to create a world that's free of infectious diseases. We work to make sure that no infectious disease is left unchallenged. We discover, develop, implement and evaluate health solutions. Working alongside the most at-risk communities. Doing so ultimately builds a healthier, safer world for everyone. We are the Kirby Institute. Thank you very much to all those who are joining us today for the Kirby Institute's International Women's Day special event. Count her in, invest in women, accelerate progress. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to chair this event today. My name is Virginia Wiseman. I'm Professor of Health Economics and Health Systems Research at the Kirby Institute at the University of New South Wales and also at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Today, I'm joining you from the lands of the Bidjigal people, the traditional custodians of the land. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So just a few quick housekeeping matters before we get on our way today. The format for this webinar, it will start off with presentations from our guest speakers, followed by Q&A. You can ask questions throughout the webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. For those who are also joining from the Kirby Institute seminar room, uh, you can use your own laptop, phone, or the laptop that is available on the lectern to post any questions or comments. So now to turn to the topic at hand. The case for economically empowering women has never been stronger. But this still needs to become a reality for many women around the world. Today, we're going to hear from four speakers working in very different settings in Australia, Papua New Guinea and Peru about the challenges and strategies to make a difference in women's lives. So our first speaker uh, is Dr. Joanne Flavel a research fellow at the Stretton Institute at Adelaide University, who will be speaking about the social determinants of health, defined by the WHO as the non-medical factors that influence health and how they can contribute to the economic exclusion of women in Australia. Then we're going to hear from Professor Marie Toombs, Professor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health and School of Population Health at the University of New South Wales. She'll be speaking about the intersection between Aboriginality, mental health and access to care. Our third speaker is Dr. Lisa Vellerly, Senior Research Fellow in the Global Health Programme at the Kirby Institute, again at the University of New South Wales. She began working as a midwife in PNG 30 years ago and will reflect on why preventable and treatable conditions continue to take the lives of so many women and their babies and how economic empowerment has such an important role to play in a solution. Finally, Ms. Karina Romero, epidemiologist and environmental health researcher at the Centre for Excellence in Chronic Diseases at the Cayentano Heredia University in Peru. Many of you will be aware that the health and working conditions of women domestic workers has become a global concern. Karina will be speaking about the ANITA project, which evaluates social protection policies for women domestic workers in Peru and other countries, taking a co-design approach. So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Joanne Flavel. Research Fellow, Stretton Institute at the University of Adelaide. Over to you, Joanne. So hello, everybody. It's an honour to be at this event today. 
to light this important occasion of International Women's Day. And I'm really pleased to talk to you today about gender, economic exclusion and health for women. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this presentation is given on the land of the Ghana people and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge that sovereignty of this country was never ceded. I'll start with an overview. Importantly, I'll begin by acknowledging the role of intersectionality and how intersectionality can result in confounding disadvantage. I'm going to draw on an overview of key messages from policies developed by the Public Health Association of Australia, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, uh, Special Interest Group Committee and members. Then I'll talk about findings from uh, Restoring the Fair Go Social Epidemiology and published work by others who have examined gender inequality in detail for key social terms of health. I need to acknowledge that Restoring the Fair Go is Graham Baum's NHMRC Investigator Fellowship. I'd like to acknowledge the team, Connie Mussolino, Toby Freeman, Julia Renata, and of course, Fran. Connie's research examines gender inequality, so I'll be referring to some of her work. I'll also be speaking about some analysis that I conducted on gender, social terms of health, and health inequity. Intersectionality refers to how factors intersect to and interact to cause and compound inequality. I want to acknowledge the role of intersectionality as it's very relevant in any discussion of gender and economic exclusion. Factors that can intersect include gender, and by that I mean diverse genders, not male, just male and female, sexuality, sex characteristics, disability, rurality, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander status, and socioeconomic. People with most of these factors experience societal stigma and discrimination, inequities in social terms of health, and barriers in access to healthcare, and all of this contributes to health inequities. Insecure employment, income, racism, ableism, and gender norms underpin persistence of gender inequality in Australia and globally, which is drawn from some of Connie Wesleyan's work. Multiple intersecting factors contribute to and compound health inequities. The analysis I refer to in much of the rest of this presentation is unfortunately based on data with binary gender, which is a limitation of much data but I will acknowledge evidence related to other aspects of intersectionality as well throughout this presentation. So the social epidemiology analysis for restoring the fair go analyzes patterns and trends in the distribution of key social determinants of health. And by that, I mean income, wealth, housing, education, employment, and social inclusion. Uh, data sources that I analyzed were the Public Health Information Development Unit, Australian Bureau of Statistics, Australian Institute for Health and Welfare, and published reports from ACOS, per capita, Australian Institute, and others. I analysed data from the 1980s until the most recently available, where it was available for this whole time period. Um, some periods were, were shorter for some um, variables. Uh, gender wasn't a specific focus of this research, but we did have findings related to gender, and we draw on evidence by gender in published reports by others, and I'll discuss this. So starting with income, which is really key to economic exclusion, income inequality is much higher now than it was in the 1980s. Um, it increased particularly in the boom from 2000 to 2008. Um, there is in particular been an increase in the share of national income held by the top 1% and the top 10%, and women are underrepresented at the top of this income distribution. There's been a lot of recent discussion about the gender pay gap, the Actuaries Institute estimated the gender pay gap in their 2023 report using household income and lab dynamics in Australia data, and it was estimated at $16,000 per year. Uh, lower income leads to lower wealth accumulation, lower superannuation balances, and a higher risk of financial insecurity persisting to later in life. Um, other aspects of intersectionality, the Actuaries Institute also estimated income gap for country of birth. If we're born in a country that's not a wealthy English-speaking country, we're estimated to have an income gap of $13,000 a year. The income gap for disability was estimated to be $8,000 per year, which I suspect is an underestimate. Uh, due to ongoing impacts of colonisation, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were twice as likely to be in the lowest income quintile compared with non-Indigenous people. And Marie will be far more qualified to talk about this than me, but I just want to acknowledge that these factors do intersect and income gaps are much larger for people who are in multiple of these groups. Women are a higher proportion of carers and single parents, the impacts of this on income. Gender norms about caring, my colleague Tommy Mussolino's work, really influenced this. ACOS has estimated poverty rates and the overall poverty rate is about 13, 13 to 14%. And the poverty rates are much higher for recipients of parenting payment, a 72% poverty rate, Carer payment, 39% poverty rate, and sole parent households, 
34% poverty rate. So most most of them, it's mostly women. So that's that's really bad sign. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about housing and wealth here. So there's been increasing wealth inequality in Australia as well. A wealth inequality is much worse than income inequality. And the growth for the top 1%, top 10%, top 20% has been much, much faster than the growth in income and much faster than for those lower on the wealth distribution. Women are again underrepresented in the top 1%, top 10%, top 20% by wealth. The capita has done some work on housing inequality and they found a gender gap in home ownership rates. A per capita report on glass ceilings, gendered inequality in the housing system, found that women support significantly higher housing related financial difficulties than men. Women are more likely to be a private sector renter, less likely to own a house as an owner occupier, and less likely to own an investment property. Women who do own property are more likely to be experiencing mortgage stress compared with men. Um, for women, it's about one in four. For men, it's less than one in five. Women buy property later in life, on average than men, and pay off their mortgages later in life. As with income, intersection only compounds wealth inequality. People with disability have lower wealth, and women with disability have even lower wealth. Moving on to employment, um, I've got a bit on this. I probably won't say it all because I know about we're pretty short on time. It links closely with income. Women's labour force participation has steadily climbed and was the highest it's ever been in 2022. So I know I've had some negative statistics. That's one positive one. Pennington and Stanford from the Australia Institute did note, though, that we still have lower labour force participation rate for women than in 18 other OECD countries. There's also a social gradient in labour force participation. Labour force participation is much higher um, for the least disadvantaged and decreases with increasing disadvantage. And the social gradient is um, steeper for female labour force participation, so there's a greater difference by socioeconomic status. And social economic has also social economic inequality has also increased between 2006 and 2016. And this analysis for ABS statistics on labour force participation, which found that women have higher underemployment, higher part-time employment, higher casual employment, which impacts on income and economic exclusion, and I know won't be news to any of you. Casual employees are concentrated amongst the lowest income earners. Um, and while it's possible for part-time jobs to be well paid, most are not, as Pennington Standard found. Uh, women need part-time work often to balance caring responsibilities, but half of part-time jobs are casual and do not offer leave entitlements that are needed to balance those parenting responsibilities. Um, I'll probably skip over some of the rest of this. It's just um, women's work is very much undervalued because it's seen as an extension of their caring, their unpaid caring, um, which really, you know, we should be able to do better than that. In terms of intersectionality, the employment rate is lower for recently arrived migrants, differs by country's birth, uh, as well for refugees, young people, people with disability, and also for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But I will note that the employment rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people has increased, so there's a positive sign there. The social exclusion monitor developed by the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence has found that, that women are more likely to be socially excluded. Got a figure here that I have created from ABS historical data um, from labour force participation between 1966 to 2022. And here you can see that positive trend has been a decline in the male labour force participation rate over this period and a steady increase in the female labour force participation rate. A bit on the gender and health inequities analysis that I did as a sub project of restoring a fair go. It did only have binary gender, as I mentioned, it's a limitation of many data sources. I'm only going to discuss the female statistics in detail. The analysis reveals a clear social gradient in self-rated health with it worsening with low income, lower education, employment status, and other factors. So you can see there that the difference by income, with high income women having the lowest um, poor health and low income, middle income having higher and low income having the highest poor health. It's worse for household income. This is for personal income. Uh, women migrants, from non-English speaking countries have higher poor self-rated health compared with Australian born women and women migrants from English speaking countries. And there's a gradient by employment status, education and analysis stratified by multiple social attempts of health revealed compounding disadvantage. Um, evidence in multiple other studies indicates worse morbidity for women compared with men. Women have longer life expectancy, but worse morbidity. And I'm just on my last slide now. And I want to finish on a more positive note. We have had that growing labor for women. We also have high year 12 attainment for women, higher than that for men, 
women are actually, or girls are doing much better on many um, of the educational achievement um, throughout the, throughout from early years through to um, high school, primary school, all of that. There's been an increase in availability of paid parental leave, important for overcoming those barriers to labor participation, and an increase in the proportion of women in management positions. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Joanne. As hard as it is, I'm going to keep us moving on to the next speaker. There was lots of uh, really uh, interesting um, ideas and uh, evidence that were presented, but I think we can come back and, and have our panel discussion at the end. So thanks, Joanne. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Professor Marie Toombs. Um, as I mentioned before, she is in the School of Population Health and is Professor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health. Um, over to you, Marie. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, Yama Gaya Yanaga Banda Yana Nama Gara Ba Kuma Yalit Yurali I. Bara Gaya Wari Bijigul Bara Yanaga Bara Diliga Yinara Balarai Bara Yilarai Bara Wawan. So I'd like to acknowledge the first peoples over this land that we are on today, the Bijigul peoples. I am a Kuma Yurali I woman from a place called Gaduga, which has been voted the most boringest town in Australia but there's some good talent that comes out of it. So I am going to be speaking to you today about, yeah, my life's journey, I suppose, in research in 10 minutes. So strap in and we'll get started. Okay, so I've acknowledged country. This is where my mob come from, up from um, northwest of um, Lightning Ridge. And I want to um, dedicate this um, International Women's Day um, to my family and to these women in my life who um, go back five generations. So great grandmother, great grandmother, grandmother, my mother, myself. And my daughter is the first in family to actually finish school and the first in family to not know poverty. Um, this photo is of my nana here and my great grandmother and they were forcibly removed from country and placed onto a mission and that broke down family structures. So it's interesting how I've ended up in the space of research and I call myself more of a facilitator because I don't actually like the word research when you're working with Indigenous peoples. So, but let's get started. So I was finishing off my PhD in um, 2011, I think it was, when a very prickly boss darkened the doorway um, of my office and said, are you Toomsie? Um, you're going to be a researcher. And I was like, who are you? Long story short, he turned out to be a wonderful man. But um, I said to him, I'm not doing research into anything. I will go and yarn with mob. And if they are interested in particular areas, then I will support that. So I did a big driving trip out to where my family come from and others and sat down with communities and overwhelmingly everybody said that we need support around understanding prevalence of mental illness, which was really interesting. And that was really coupled with how that looks from a Western viewpoint versus a um, a traditional model. And so, yeah, so we, we, um, we got some funding around that. But likewise, it was around suicide intervention, which was actually the biggest um, issue that came up, and access to primary health care. So the first couple of slides are going to focus on a research grant um, called iAssist, and I will be talking about the research and using the word suicide a bit at this point. So I'm just putting that out as a preface because I don't want to upset anybody. Okay, so... In the development of ISIST, um, we, we got some funding initially through NHMRC and it was to co-design a suicide intervention program off the back of, of yarning with those communities that I showed you that previous image of. And what people were saying is um, it was basically that our children don't kill themselves between the hours of nine and five and we need a program um, and support so that we can actually do something about this outside of those um, business hours. And so that really struck me. And so it was through that process that we worked with over 90 communities to develop a um, world first suicide intervention training program that now partners with an organisation 
called Living Works. And Living Works is a Canadian company, but does suicide intervention internationally. Um, we've trained over 6,000 people to date. And we know in the first three months of the pilot study that we um, conducted 120 interventions. So that equals 120 lives saved. And there's a model that comes out of the Queensland government, oh, not the Queensland government, can you tell I'm from Queensland, out of um, the federal government that says for one um, life lost to suicide, it costs the Australian taxpayer $4 million. So if you times that, 120 interventions in the first three months alone, um, that $840,000 um, NHMRC target call has well and truly paid for itself. The big thing that I wanted to do in terms of this particular project, but all of the projects, is to make sure that what we do is also giving back um, to the community in terms of reciprocity. And I mentioned that piece about poverty at the beginning and the chronic diseases and all of the issues that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are afflicted with are grounded in poverty. Suicide is an endpoint uh, relating to hopelessness. And so I felt with this particular program that we needed to also build some self-determination into this. So one being a strength-based program that community com members can use in real time. But secondly, a social enterprise model so that people can be trained in this. They can actually pursue their own funding and deliver this program um, into communities that are um, in areas and, um, and provide possibilities for people to actually earn some um, money from doing this as well. So this is the ISIS protocol that was developed and it speaks to community engagement and setting these programs or the training up properly before we go in and actually do it. And this protocol is actually, I think, just common sense for any research that you do with any community anywhere in the world. And so, you know, you, you go and you make sure that you're being invited in in the first place. Um, once you have ascertained that, you set up the supports that are required. And so in this case, a lot of um, community members wanted to have a traditional healer there to support them throughout this process or a smoking ceremony. Some wanted psychologists there. Some just wanted um, to make sure that the people coming into the room were actually safe themselves to do this as well. So the second part of the training was this community connection. So which was a yarning circle of about three hours prior to conducting the training so that people had an opportunity to connect with each other. And culturally, that's really, really important that we share story, we connect, but in doing that, we're healing each other as well. So we found in this research that over 78% of all participants who have done this training had a direct suicide within their, their immediate family. So unfortunately, here in Australia, we have some of the highest rates in the world. And in our 11 to 15 year olds, um, we have the highest rates in the world. So this program has been highly effective and um, where we are today is it has been rolled out nationally. Um, research that actually did translate into practice, which is really, really exciting. And I wanted to share this with you because this was all done by the community. I just facilitated it and we were able to come up with the, this um, amazing program. I have no idea how much longer I've got, but I'm sure someone will tell me when to stop talking. So, um, and just on this again, so um, it's a social enterprise model, it's community ownership. You have to be Indigenous to lead this training. Um, and it's all about trying to maintain um, sustainability uh, within communities. And we've got some great examples of how we've done that. And, um, and here's some photos of one of our training sessions. I think this might have been the second one that we did up in the Northern Territory. All right, second one, primary health care. When I die, if that van is on my gravestone, I'll be very, very happy. So that was a little um, Health Work Australia um, funding grant. So once again, coming off the back of what communities were saying around access to primary health care, um, we did a scope of areas around the Darling Downs in southeast Queensland and found that 
Um, there were lots of children that were not being vaccinated because they didn't have access to health services and a whole range of things. We went for this funding and we got this van and it's um, it was through the University of Queensland. So it's called the Mob Van or the Mobile Outreach Boomerang. We come back and we went down to a place called Warwick, which is a little town um, south west of um, Brisbane. And we asked if we could set this up at the hospital there um, because we knew that there was a really big um, area, like geographical area of Aboriginal peoples that weren't accessing good health. And the hospital said no. And so we were like, right oh. So we went to the local council and they said that we could put it in the park in the middle of town, but if anything happened to it, it was on us. So um, we agreed to do that and, um, and we opened our doors with a GP, a couple, couple of Aboriginal health workers and some medical students and nursing students on board from the University of Queensland. And the community said, we want it, we'll use it, you know, all of these things. The council said there are no Aboriginal people in Warwick and I'm like, well, I beg to differ. It's just that they're not using your services because they mustn't be culturally um, safe. So, um, so we opened the van doors on this particular day and an elder went past and he kind of looked in, gave us a little wink and kept going. And then the next day, people started to flow through it. So within the first nine months, we had 1,500 people accessing that van. And off the back of that, the, um, the Queensland government funded us for a fixed clinic. Um, of which I will show you here. And um, Kabul Aboriginal Medical Service actually took over the role of um, taking on the van and its, um, its clients. And we established Kabul Medical Services, of which I was the chair for 14 years. But um, yeah, I'm very, very proud of this one. Um, I could talk about a whole lot of things, but I think... I might just leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marie. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the idea of I know that you've you've been um, recognizing um, the importance of the way that you work with communities, and it's a it's a, a community driven sort of achievements. But national rollout of programs, setting up new clinics where they're needed, it's an, it's an incredible achievement. Um, I should refer to you as Toomsey from now on. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we're going to come back to all of that shortly. Um, I think now we'll just keep moving along. Uh, we're going to go from um, Queensland, Australia. We're going to now move to hearing about Papua New Guinea. And as I mentioned, our next speaker is Dr. Lisa Valley, um, who is midwife and public health researcher here at Kirby and also has worked for many years with the Institute of Medical Research in Garoka. PNG. Uh, over to you, Lisa. This International Women's Day, I want to draw our attention to how gender and economic exclusion can create poor health outcomes for women and their children. I will focus on how these present barriers to accessing healthcare and what still needs to be done to tackle the underlying issues around equity and justice. I will reflect on my experience as a midwife and maternal health researcher in Papua New Guinea, which began nearly 30 years ago. In 1995, I was recruited as a volunteer to work in a rural health centre to provide all aspects of maternal health care and train village midwives to support the then 85% of births that took place in the community in that district. We've learnt a lot since then, and we no longer advocate the training of village birth attendants. We know that if we want to improve outcomes for women and their babies, we need women to have access to comprehensive reproductive health care with births attended by skilled attendants able to provide essential and emergency obstetric and newborn care. But of course, care can only be provided if women are able to access and receive timely and appropriate levels of care. In Papua New Guinea, national estimates indicate that currently less than half of all pregnant women attend for antenatal care once in their pregnancy. Less than one third attend four times and just over one third give birth with a skilled healthcare worker. The result is poor uptake of care are reflected in the poor health outcomes for women and their newborns. Papua New Guinea 
has the highest maternal mortality, one of the highest maternal mortality ratios in the world, with around 145 to 434 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. This means that in Papua New Guinea, every day, up to four women die as a result of pregnancy and childbirth. The newborn mortality rate at 22 deaths per 1,000 live births means 18 newborns die every day in Papua New Guinea. And sadly, in addition to this burden, we have a stillbirth rate of 16 per 1,000 births. That means 13 babies are born still every day in Papua New Guinea. So let's take a step back and see why women don't or are unable to attend for care. Many of the factors and constraints facing women in accessing timely care during pregnancy and birth are well described and the same in Papua New Guinea as in many other low resource settings across the world. So what are these factors? The globally recognised three delays framework is as relevant in Papua New Guinea as many other low middle income settings, whereby one delay leads to another with decision making, seeking and receiving care all impacting the outcome for women and their newborns. Papua New Guinea is geographically and culturally diverse, with around 87% of the population living in rural areas. The mountainous mainland and thousands of islands along the coast means access to healthcare is a huge problem for many and not only women. But it's not just geography, lack of transport or the season that influences whether women reach antenatal care or a health facility to give birth. Before she sets off on her journey, who makes the decision about whether she could or should attend for antenatal care or to give birth? Husbands, mothers, mother-in-laws, sisters, aunties may all have input in deciding when is the best time to attend or in fact, if she should or needs to attend. Despite their best efforts, sometimes women's decisions and choices are overruled by those she is living with or close to. Once a decision is made to seek health care, how does she get there? Is there transport, private vehicle, bus, boat? Is there money for transport? Is it night time, meaning we have to wait until daylight to travel because maybe it's unsafe to travel after dark? Who will look after the house or other children while she's gone? And who will go with the woman in labour to support and provide care for her? Assuming the health facility is reached, which may be hours or even days away for some women, once you've arrived at the facility, is it open? Is there a nurse on duty? Are they able to manage labour and birth and care of the newborn? Do they have the skills needed to recognise and manage problems during labour, birth or in caring for the newborn? So in thinking about the decision to seek care, a number of issues arise for many women with many of these influenced by their level of education, age, language barriers and specific cultural beliefs and practices. And all this taking place within the context of her agency and her relationships within family and community. Our research over many years in Papua New Guinea at the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research has highlighted the significantly increased burden of adverse birth outcomes, including among women living in rural settings, among younger women and women who have attended primary education only or not had any formal education. Women in these situations have lower attendance for antenatal care, are less likely to give birth in a health facility and more likely to experience unsafe abortion, preterm birth, stillbirth, early newborn deaths and low birth weight babies. Nationally in Papua New Guinea, the age of sexual debut is said to be around 18 years for women, but we know from our own research that it is younger women in a number of settings across the country and unplanned pregnancy is also high with uptake of modern contraceptives low at around about 30% among women who are married. In 2021, the UNFPA described the health and economic benefits of scaling up the family planning and maternal health interventions simultaneously in five countries across the region, Kiribati, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga and Vanuatu. It provides compelling evidence for the prioritising and funding of essential sexual and reproductive health services, including family planning and maternal health, to reduce unintended pregnancies, resulting in reduced maternal deaths, stillbirths and newborn deaths. While access to care in Papua New Guinea is challenging for many, 
Uptake of care is further hindered by the lack of decision making and autonomy, a situation that has changed, sadly changed very little over the last 30 years. Women continue to give birth in the village, a decision frequently made by others. The outcomes are similar to 30 years ago, with women dying as a consequence of childbirth, frequently due to postpartum hemorrhage, the number one cause of maternal death in Papua New Guinea, as it is globally. And women experiencing complications as a result of unsafe abortion, frequently undertaken due to fear of bringing shame to the family because they are young, unmarried, or have a desire to continue with their education. Adolescent girls need to continue their education and women need the opportunity to develop their skills to enable them to participate in the economy and society. Women need equity in their relationships with their partners and families and communities and need to feel empowered to make choices and decisions about their health and their bodies. The unmet need for contraception and inequitable access to paternal health care and evidence-based life savings interventions require major and sustained investment that need to be addressed not only the reach and quality of health service and the delivery, but must also seek to address the underlying structural and systems context in which women's lives are lived. Placing equity and justice firmly at the heart of all future efforts to improve the lives and health of girls and women in Papua New Guinea and other high burden, low resource settings in our region will enable us to make real progress in the coming decades that has largely eluded us in the past. Thanks so much, Lisa. I think that uh, you've emphasised very clearly the importance of economic power. Um, things like having uh, work, uh, being able to earn an income, um, receiving a grant, these kind of initiatives are empowering potentially, but they don't necessarily uh, provide economic power to all women in terms of being able to take that income and use it in ways they want to use it, um, to be able to have access to childcare, to be able to work. Um, all of these factors um, are really at the roots of economic power and empowerment. Um, so thanks very much, Lisa. I think now we're going to move from PNG to Peru. Um, and we have our last speaker, uh, Ms. Karina Romero, as I said, who is um, going to talk to us about the ANITA project, a very unique um, and exciting project about domestic workers. Um, in Peru and beyond. So over to you, Karina. Thank you. So tonight, um, I'm going to share some insights from the NITA project. Uh, this is a project funded by the Canada International Development and Research Center, uh, which pursue action-oriented and gender transformative research on women's workers' health and their working conditions. So. We move, as you said, to Peru now. Um, and first, I just want to add a bit of context um, that globally, most women are employed in the informal sector with little or not known access to social protection. And um, if we look in low middle income countries, like certain areas in Peru, 92% of women are informally employed. Uh, in addition, in the time of COVID, women make up 70% of the health workforce worldwide, and therefore they were in the forefront of the COVID-19 response. And with this context in 2021, uh, there was a call initiative uh, named Women Rise, um, which under uh, uh, which our team uh, received and um, submit a proposal to develop this ANITA project. Um, and this initiative was looking uh, for action-oriented and gender transformative research on how women's health and their work, this could be paid or unpaid, intersect and interact in the context of recovery from COVID-19. Uh, there were like, it's not only this site in Peru, there were like uh, 22 projects and South America, Central America, Africa, and Asia, 
that responds to this call and address uh, uh, different topics on women's workers uh, and women working conditions. In the case of Anita, uh, we were looking for addressing the challenges and constraints of social protection policies for women domestic workers in Peru. And there was a couple of, of additional information, right? And, and that I would like to, to mention. Uh, in, during the COVID-19 outbreak, um, 52 or 72 percent of domestic workers lost their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not known if they had some social protection funds, but uh, in addition, others were forced to stay at their employer's house during months without permission to visit their families or relatives under these fears of COVID infections, right? So this news struck to our team. And, and as it was mentioned at the same time, this Women Rights Initiative pop up and our team decided to, uh, to put together this proposal. Um, additionally, in 2021, right, the midst of COVID, Peru approved a social protection law for domestic workers. But this not, did not happen because of the only the government initiative. This was an initiative of domestic workers organizations who were fighting years before of the COVID to make this uh, go through and to get what they call um, the rights that they deserve, right? In the past, there was not any specific law of protection for this type of workers. But despite of counting with this social protection law approved in 2021, still, until today, 87% of domestic workers in Peru are informally employed. 96% of these domestic workers are, of course, women. Um, that add more layers for us to decide to explore what's going on with this, what is happening with this uh, law and the implementation, what are the barriers, the challenges and constraints to get access to domestic workers to get access to social protection policies, right? Um, before I move more deeper into Anita, I just want to mention uh, that this is not a only a situation that's happened in, only in Peru, right? Globally, there are 75, 76 million people that are domestic workers, and half of the less than half of the world's countries have some form of social protection for domestic workers. And for social protection, our team used the definition of the International Labor Organization, that is uh, social protection or social security as a human right and is defined as this set of policies and programs designing to reduce and prevent poverty and vulnerability through the life cycle, right? This could be uh, uh, policies like uh, um, to get a uh, sick pay leave, uh, to get paid vacation, and so on. Well, um, what exactly are the aims of our project? Um, two main aims. The first is to examine the working in condition and access to healthcare of women domestic workers. And second, to propose recommendations to improve access to social protection and to do this uh, using a participatory action research. We're trying to go through to these recommendations through a co-design process that starts since the beginning, since um, our project is, is, is using a mixed method um, methodology, and in all the phases of our project, we have um, uh, this participatory uh, approach that involves different actors and stakeholders uh, which are relevant to this uh, problematic. And of course, we also are doing this addressing that there are glass ceilings, broken stairs, there are, there is and the representation of women and decision tables. And that's why also uh, as part of our project, we have uh, as principal investigators, uh, someone from the government, someone that we call our decision maker PI. So we could have these insights and try to 
brings like a setup, uh, like, um, I say, forgot the name, <laughs> bridge, right? Bridge between the academia and, and the public and the policy sector and trying to go to uh, help and, and go through this uh, process of the uh, public policies based on evidence. That's what we are trying to do at the end. At the same time, we are also addressing that there is underrepresentation of vulnerable women in the research table also. And, and that's why we are trying to uh, engage with these women and as an active actors in our research. Okay, um, here I wanna share a couple of the strategies that are related to co-design and participatory research that our project is doing. Um, for these knowledge mobilization strategies, always following this intersectional approach, we first of all start engaged as I said, engaging relevant stakeholders from the academia, from activists for the domestic workers' rights, but also for the domestic workers' organization. That is something that we learn at the moment that we start to, to study more uh, to the um, to launch this study, right? We, we learn that uh, domestic workers are a vulnerable population, but at the same time in Peru, there are these organizations of people, of women who are unionized or not, and who have been fighting for their rights. And so we invite them to be part of our advisory committee and to provide feedback during the stage, different stage of our project. Uh, at the same time, during this process, we learned that most of these women domestic workers have already been involved with previous research. So um, a couple of them were, uh, um, we invite them and, and we include them as our, our co-investigators committee, addressing that they are live experience experts. Um, and, and we involve them in different process, like uh, in this picture, like in our peer review process to validate section of, an, of one ANITA survey that was the first, is the first survey in Peru that is focused on domestic workers, employment and health conditions. They were really a strike, a stroke, uh, a surprise um, that uh, someone from the academia was reaching out, reaching them, uh, uh, not only to talk about their labor rights, but overall to talk about their health condition. Uh, although these were some kind of empowerment women, that they were fighting for their rights. Um, they were focusing only in, in the labor condition and the health was not a factor in, in the in the wisdom list at that moment. So they were really content that our group was starting to look for, for their conditions. Um, Another strategy in our group was to sustain equitable relationship between the project partners. We, we are not, not only, we have a Peruvian team, but we also have a Canada team. And, and also our co-researchers, um, live experience expert. And, and we, we feel that this, this was key to have this type of horizontal relationship and get the feedback from the ground expert. And I do love that picture because we, there I show in our two Marias. We have in the right side is Maria Lasso, who is our physician in the group, expert in co-design methods. And in the left is our another Maria, who is an expert domestic worker um, from another union. And another strategy and, and that still we are starting to implement it, but still uh, we are don't have the final results, so it is, it is going to is ongoing, is to disseminate the project activities and research output with guidance and help of our partners, uh, researchers and non researchers to relevant publics, uh, but using different communication channels, right? Yes, we do wanna share evidence through open access journals. We also wanna share through uh, Zoom video calls um, to, exchange uh, knowledge at this uh, webinar that we did uh, with our Canada team to learn new methods, but also we wanna have evidence 
in a way to share with our domestic workers organization WhatsApp channels. Um, so that was uh, something that have, um, it's, it's looked like so simple, but um, um, it, it, it brings some challenges, right? And it brings the challenge of us from the academia to learn, to share our findings in a way that is useful and understandable and, and from, from the people that that is, is working with us in, in this research. Um, so it is has been, and it is a challenging project, but at the same time have many rewards. For example, this activity in the bottom is one that was organized by them. One of our domestic workers um, committee members is also the leader of the Afro-Peruvian Women Workers Association. So they organize their annual meeting and they invite us because they feel that they want to also share the, the news, the information, the preliminary evidence from women, Afro-Peruvian women domestic workers, right? Um, so again, that's looking for, for this co-participatory research, action research, um, it, it, it has been a, a really enrichment uh, experience. Um, so I just want to start with this take home message. Um, I just want to mention that these studies are still ongoing, so we still don't have final final results. But um, I feel like I, from what I mentioned today, some points to stick on is this, right? That the women make up 70% of the health force, workforce, workforce, and we need to prevent and be prepared for future pandemics, right? Um, globally, most women are employed in the informal sector, 92% in low middle income country with little or no access to social protection and social protection is a human right. And also these intersectionality lens are key. Um, one of some more preliminary results is saying that uh, among women from the service sector, domestic workers are the worst working condition, are the, the ones that have the worst working condition. And among those domestic workers, the mo uh, there are another groups of most vulnerable, and those are the adolescents, the senior, and the racialized women. So again, this uh, I guess uh, alongside these talks, we have here from intersectionality and the importance of this approach. And finally, that participatory action research and the live experience er experts enrich the research process. So. I just what I wanna stop and say thank you everybody and remind that nothing about us should be without us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karina. And thanks, I should have also noted, thank you for joining in your evening. We really appreciate it. Um, that was an excellent presentation. If I could just invite all of the presenters to turn on their videos, that would be great. And I guess maybe we've had a few questions um, uh, in the Q&A box, but just before we turn to those, I wondered if I could just pose a very broad question to our panellists, and that is International Women's Day, uh, sharing experiences and presentations as we have done today. Um, how important do you think that is that we come together and do this sort of thing for International Women's Day? Any any reflections? Should I go first, please. Uh, I think I think it's really important um, to point out the work that still needs to be done, which of course is a lot of what we've discussed today. Um, something that we haven't covered so much, but I know is often covered in International Women's Day, is the achievements that women have made by celebrating the progress, but then also pointing out where things can be done better. So to me, I think that is, and, and I think that's what I said last International Women's Day when I was asked to comment on it, and <laughs> before as well. So it's it's a really important occasion to really mark the progress we've made, the achievements that women have. You know, women are doing wonderful work and we need to acknowledge that, um, but also, yeah, just the highlight this problem. Great, thanks, Joanne. I see Lisa's <laughs> trying to join, but having some difficulty with the internet. I don't know if uh, Marie or Karina, you had any 
reflections? Marie? I'm happy to jump in. It's such a Thanks. big question. It sounds like I know. A question, but it's like, how long is a piece of string? So, um, like, absolutely, we have to do it. And we know that we're behind the eight ball in terms of um, all things. And yet we make up, I think we're over 50% of the, the population. Um, I'm big on education and, you know, ignorance is bliss. So through these types of opportunities, we can share stories. But also, I think we should remember our um, our men in this as well. And we've got some wonderful I don't know if we call them allies, but, you know, um, men that work with work and walk with us. And so I think we need to build a bigger um, pool of those men to support us as well, because, you know, it's one thing for us to to kind of be pushing all of these um, really important areas, but we need our men to actually back us as well and and I'm starting to see that a little bit more but I'm also seeing that you know some of the gaps are actually getting getting wider again and so it's it's how we address those things so I don't know if I really answered it but um, no no <laughs> no it's good to get those reflections and I'm glad you brought up the point about uh, engaging with our uh, uh, men that we work with and also, I guess, you know, in our homes and our communities, everyone getting on board. Um, Karina, did you have anything um, you wanted to say about International Women's Day more generally? Um, well, I just agree totally with Marie that um, we are not alone, right? We are a community in this sorority, meaning it shouldn't be only about women, right? We, we need everybody here, but also we, it's a good moment to, to remind and address all the people behind us, women's, men's, diversity who fight for uh, for our rights, right? Um, to address that there, were, that there are gender inequalities, but at the same time that um, there are still uh, this, we need to keep uh, with this intersectionality lens Right, addressing that we women here are women with privilege, and there are others that uh, need our help in doing this work with the domestic workers. It it was so nice working together, right, in the same table, and they say, "Oh, I feel like I'm not alone." Finally, right, I have somebody else that do also care of me. Um, so I, I I like that idea, and thank you for for inviting me. And from Peru being there with you guys. <laughs> it's great to have Peru on board. Karina, maybe I could just follow up with you briefly then, um, because you have focused quite a lot on COVID. I'm just wondering how much, how important has COVID been? Obviously, this is not a new challenge. It's not a new problem. But, you know, to what extent has COVID sort of enabled a, a closer light to be shone on the issue, particularly that, you've been talking about today around domestic workers um, acknowledging it's not new but has it sort of given a greater attention because as you said it's, it's, it was almost here right we are just recovering but it looked like we are not talking about that and Peru was really a strike with one of the worst uh, countries with the worst uh, uh, multimorbidity uh, prevalence, right? Our hospital collapse. And even though at some point people were saying that Peru is, is, is going from low mid to low to middle income country, right? This Peru as a phenomenon in economy, but uh, COVID had showed this kind of, of what was going behind, right? That we were not growing up uh, under with solid basements with solid base, um, but feel that was a topic needed. We, we made a couple of, in our Anita survey, we made a couple of, of questions about COVID. And it was at the first time that the, the domestic workers were talking about this, right? They say that they have not enough time to move from this process to talk about, even to talk about their own conditions and, and long COVID, it's like that they are not mapping that. So although it's a difficult and, and sensitive topic, 
is needed. We need still more research about this to, to find out what's going on there, right? What, what's all the consequence and also to, to prevent. Thank you. I don't know, Joanne or Marie or Lisa, is there anything, uh, I just guess I'm sort of um, thinking about COVID and how the pandemic or even future pandemics you know, is this sort of um, helping to shine more of a light on on the need for greater economic empowerment of women? Um, did you have any thoughts on that? I have. Yeah. Um, something that was really infuriating was where it did shine a light on the, especially the frontline healthcare workers. And um, I know a lot of frontline healthcare workers had an issue with this as well is, oh, your heroes, your heroes, but then when they wanted an increase in their pay because they're not well enough paid for it, oh, no, we're not going to give you that. But So they sort of said, don't call us heroes, just value the work. So that that was something that yeah, it was seen like, we really need this work, these people doing this work, um, with, and mostly women doing the work as well with the care work. Um, but it still wasn't valued well enough to then... Yeah. Yeah, so that 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 was a point that really, yeah, I think yeah. frustrated a lot of women. And I think that we've seen that, if I could just add, we've seen in areas like food security and climate change um, discussions, women are always said to be or often said to be at the forefront, you know, with their their knowledge uh, in food production or it might be in, in you know, the way they um um, small grants to be entrepreneurs and farmers and to, you know, improve biodiversity, but actually um, financing for women in these areas is really, really small. <laughs> and it's, it's sort of, um, you know, we're not really, we're not really making a lot of progress is my observation yet. Um, Marie, I don't know if you had any other thoughts you want to throw oh, into it. So much going through my head. I mean, of course, I mean, my reference point is Indigenous women, Aboriginal women, because that's, you know, my standpoint. But um, I just think about, you know, for Aboriginal Australians, we are still in that space of poverty for many of us. And, like, I would consider myself a wealthy woman and I'm one of very, very small you know, group of people in Australia that can say that as an Aboriginal person. And so when we think about the COVID response, um, when we think about women, um, you know, and domestic violence, and we think about women who, you know, like um, birth way before their due dates and all the risks that sit around mm -hmm. us, we live in a, um, a first world country. And yet, you know, our women are still in these positions where, um, yeah, we're just so far behind the eight ball. And it's the women that are making the change in these spaces. So, you know, in the research sphere, for example, when um, when researchers connect with these communities, it's usually the women that are there and they'll do this for nothing because they want to see improvements in their communities. And uh, so... I think in terms of that economic empowerment, I, I think for a lot of us, we've still got a long way to go um, here in Australia, at least. And um, and I really liked, Karina, your point about, you know, coming from a space of privilege. And I feel the same in my role. But when you go to community and you sit with, you know, community members under a tree and you feel like you're sitting with them in solidarity, even though you can feel you know the breadth of difference between your own privilege and and who you're working with so yeah I find it's a juxtaposition in a lot of ways and um you know and I I, I struggle I guess mm. um one quick thing about COVID so um the health workers the Aboriginal health workers that responded to COVID um outside of Brisbane in a really um a community close to Brisbane called Sherberg, and that's actually where my family was sent. Um, there was this big um, no vaccine rule, you know, no jab kind of um, paranoia going through that community. And it was the, the Aboriginal health workers of which, you know, 95% were um, women 
knocking on these doors, you know, putting their own health at risk whilst they were, you know, they had their masks and stuff on, stuff on. But like that nurturing, caring part was we have to get these people vaccinated. And those women got 97% of that community vaccinated during COVID, which I think is an amazing response. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, thanks, Marie. I think there's a, um, I'm not sure who who originally coined it, but the fact that you empower one woman, you're empowering you know, a whole community and and uh, society and and beyond. Um, thanks. I think we've lost Lisa. Uh, is that right? Maybe to the internet. Yep. Um, so I just before we switch over to the Q and A, because I think there's a sort of a, uh, a growing number of comments and questions there. I just and again. I think Marie, it's going to be a big one. But um, what you know, if if there was sort of one avenue, one spot where you could tipping point where you could do something in the respective areas that you all work in to really um, strengthen the economic empowerment of women, what would come to mind? What would be the thing that you'd sort of focus in on? Um, you know, if, yeah. Education, education, mm -hmm. like it, it's, it goes hand in hand with health, but access to good education is um, a challenge. And uh, I just, yeah, I mean, I'm where I am because my grandmother did a major intervention on me at 23. I was a fruit picker, had dropped out of school, um, you know, in the school yearbook it said, least likely to succeed, Marie Anderson. Uh, from Gadooga, <laughs> woohoo, go me! <laughs> so I showed them. <laughs> but this grandmother of mine, from mm -hmm. as young as I could possibly possibly remember, would just whisper in my ear, "Education is so important, dear." And when I didn't listen, and by the time I was twenty three, she was like, "That's it." So she actually fraudulently enrolled me in an Aboriginal enabling program up in Toowoomba at USQ. And um, it changed my life. But had I not had that education, I'd probably be, you know, doing whatever, but I would not be where I am today. So I do think giving women the opportunity to be educated, and we know in, in other countries a lot of women don't get the chance to go to school. We're seeing it play out in Afghanistan again now. So, yeah, so that would be my answer. Thanks, Marie. And it's it's speaks volumes that it was a woman that had got you on the path, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you for the example, Karina or Joanne. Uh, totally education, but also something that I learned from this work with the domestic workers that are unionized is like a to know that you have the agency and the power to organize, and and in that way to influence decision making. That was powerful. That you are not alone. Right, because yeah, you educate only one woman, okay, it, it's we have to make it. But if you encourage, organize to be together, to come as a community and fight together, I feel like uh, the weight makes more easy, more pleasure because again, you're in a community. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's also key. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Joanne? Yeah, I'm going to cheat and say two things. Um, in terms of women in work, um, I think there needs to be, and there are moves towards this, more universal access to parental leave, so that, you know, to encourage men to take leave, to take on those caring responsibilities, so it's not women holding the whole burden. And in terms of those terrible poverty rates, the figures that I read out, um, ACOS has a Raise the Rate campaign going, and I really hope that we get some traction on this because a lot, there's a number of income support payments that are below poverty line and you're never going to have economic empowerment for people who are, they don't have an option of working, they've got other responsibilities, they might have disabilities but not be able to access a disability support pension. You've got to lift those income support payments because mm. it has impacts on health, it has impacts on everything when you're having to try and live in poverty. It's awful. Thanks. So these are, you know, these are clear sort of policy changes that even just small changes can have an enormous difference. Um, yeah, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Well, look, I think um, now I'm going to switch over to um, thank you for um, the panel's feedback. And now I'm going to go to Bridget's question. Um, thanking you for your wonderful talks. It was great to see so much discussion of co-design. Karina, can I ask you about the payment of research participants who participate in co-design processes and in participatory participatory, try and say that 10 times quickly, and um, participatory action research. Yes, thank you, Bridget. Um, yes, for the ANITA project, uh, we set up an honorarium, right? We, we are addressing that these women have to dedicate a couple of hours to be and, and provide this feedback. So we set up this, we received the approval from the ethic committee. And, and it's an honorario that is uh, in relationship to their daily payment. Uh, in addition, also, we provide uh, uh, a compensation for transportation and also, if needed, um, uh, a help to, 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 yes, I forgot the name, to take care of their children or child if, if that is needed, right? So trying to, to make easy uh, this, this role. But again, addressing that, they work as a domestic workers, they were working also as a organizers, and now they have a certain work with us being part of the ANITA project. So that's, that's what I learned. Thanks, Karina. And Marie, you also, I mean, this is something very close to, to your heart and your research as well. Yeah, well, we, we do similar things. Well, here in Australia under um, NHMRC um, IREC, which is the Indigenous Research Excellence Criteria, um, there has to be reciprocity, and uh, which is wonderful. So we remunerate um, all of our participants that are involved in co-design workshops, whether it's a, a governance group, whether it's the participants themselves, um, or whoever else is part of the team. Uh, but also, we now also do things like include um, research advocates on the ground and actually give people titles so that they do feel more involved in this. But, um, yeah, I, I think co-design is an interesting phenomenon because it's become a buzzword and, you know, I think we've just got to be really careful not to confuse code design with um, collecting information um, along with participants and leaving and then not coming back and confirming and having that co-decision making that occurs in that as well. So there's a bit of that that's happening at the moment and making sure we've got that right. But remuneration, really, really important. Um, where we can, we always try to provide a um, an educational stream as well. So someone might like to do a certificate in something or they want to do whatever. Um, we always build that into our funding as well so that we can provide as many opportunities as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, Joanna, would you like, I was going to move on to the next question unless you had something you wanted to add as well. Um, I think my main point around this, because I've come across it a bit in reviewing grants, is some people will say they're doing co-design, they're not. Um, and that's the point that Marie's making as well. People call things co-design that aren't. Co-design is from start to finish. You know, your proposal, your research is informed by people have actual input into what, how you're going to do it. And, um, you know, then you do it with them and then you go back to them at the end. It's um, it's not um, doing it and then saying, what do you think of this sort of thing? So, yeah. Thank you. So quite a process. Um, great. Thanks for, for those um, thoughts. And thank you, Bridget, for the question. Um, there's another question here from Rebecca Guy, who's head of the CERT program, the Surveillance Evaluation Research Program at the Kirby Institute. Um, and um, it says really to Marie, um, do you have any words of advice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are contemplating a research career? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I've got to see the world as a result of this. Yeah, I think it's, um, oh, and it comes back to education. It's just uh, 
providing people with the opportunity and pathways to come this way. And, uh, yeah, I think that the career of a researcher is a really privileged one, particularly if you work in a space that's close to your heart. So one thing I didn't, didn't share with you was I've ended up in this mental health and wellbeing space um, and my mother was diagnosed with bipolar affective disorder when I was seven years of age. And so she's been discriminated against all of her life because of that and under involuntary treatment orders. And it, it does sit around her Aboriginality. And I could tell you a whole lot of reasons why, but I don't have the time to. So for me to work in a space that's directly related to you know, lived experience as well, makes you a really good researcher. So I think in terms of that question, you know, finding the right people and and plugging them into areas that are actually of genuine interest um, for them. But because of this kind of, um, you know, equity kind of space that we're in, it's, I think, really about going back to some really fundamental basics and, you know, it might be picking up someone that's just finished a bachelor's degree and really um, putting the time and effort into those graduates rather than trying to find a, um, a post-grad because, yeah, there's not a lot of us out there, unfortunately. Thanks, Marie. Now we've got a, a comment from Dan Daniel. Women's health, well-being and success lifts us all up and every man should support this. Ah, yay, Daniel. <laughs> we love I Daniel. <laughs> we love Daniel. I defy anybody to uh, take an opposing position on that, on International Women's Day. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you for joining. Um, now... A bit further down, we've got um, a comment from Dr. Anne Lawless. I'm thinking a lot about Karina's presentation um, and supporting working class women to find their agency and power. Intersectionality, bringing together lots of ways of thinking about class, race, power, etc., power, et cetera, seems essential to any gender analysis. Um, any reflections, uh, Karina or Joanne, on that one? I think it's a, a thumbs up for the approach that you're taking, but maybe there's uh, there's sort of uh, further reflections. I think maybe Karina is, um, yes, sorry, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna hear me. Right now, okay? Yeah. I guess I have issues, but sorry. That's okay, Karina. I think um just while you maybe sort out your audios there, uh Joanne, did you want to throw in? I just wanted to pick up the point at the end of Karina's um presentation about nothing about us without us. So um really I'm I li have I live with a disability. Um it's it's been a real issue about making policy without actually um, involving people with disability. I'm not involved in that side of things, um, but I have been getting a little bit more involved uh, with the Public Health Association of Australia on the advocacy side of things. And um, it really is just so important um, and important for, like Anne says, class, race, power, et cetera. You really do need to have um, the people who are affected by these policies um, need to be involved and goes back to the co-design as well that Marie said. Thanks, Joanne. Karina, did you have anything you wanted to add now? Um, yes, I, I totally agree with, with Anne, but um, I also want to mention that in this gender transformative approach mm -hmm. is uh, going ourselves uh, on, on this uh, constantly um, deconstruction, right? Um, Yes, we talk about the domestic workers' work uh, that is mainly developed uh, by women, right? And so we designed the ANITA project for women's domestic workers. But when we have this first meeting with our domestic workers committee, uh, they also mention, hey, but we have men domestic workers. We also have uh, trans women's domestic workers, can they also be part of the ANITA project? So they 
challenge us and remind us that we need to move for this lens, that traditional, right, that made this link about care work mainly developed for women and, and going to this transformative gender approach, right? It's it, it brings some challenges, but uh, it's, it's, it's also so important to keep this um, general deconstruction process even okay. for, for, for each of us. Yeah. I like that expression, the deconstruction process. Thank you. And Karina, just um, maybe sticking with you for a minute, there's a comment here from Jess Gibbs. Um, just wondering if there's been any domestic workers who speak Quechua who have joined the study. During COVID-19, a lot of Peruvian women who worked as domestic cleaners in Cusco also only spoke Quechua. I'm sorry, my pronunciation is probably terrible. That's not perfect. Get track. Get track people. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, the domestic workers, uh, uh, most of them are migrants. Fifty of them, or or sixty of them, are, are in Peru. Came from the Andes and, and migrate to the capitals of to the urban areas. So yes, in our project, we also have domestic workers who speak Quechua. I guess it's like a twenty percent of them. But at, at this time, most of them they are also bilinguals. And our study focused on urban domestic workers. So uh, all of them were bilingual, Quechua speakers and, and also Spanish speakers. Yeah. But that's a really point. We 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 ended up saying, oh, we need to also go and see what is the relationship, what is the, what's going on with that specific uh, population of domestic workers. Yeah. Right. Great question. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. Well, look, I think it's been a wonderful opportunity and um, I've really enjoyed, not this about me, but I've really enjoyed um, the last hour. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you, not just uh, for raising questions and identifying problems and challenges, but actually sort of thinking about strategies and solutions and um you know, some of the tipping points where you've actually seen change, you've witnessed change, you've been able to participate in change. It's been fantastic to hear about that. And I also hope that uh, we'll be able to um, have more discussions like this and not just leave them all to one day of the year <laughs> and to uh, perhaps, as as has been mentioned today, to sort of have an engaging um uh, discussion with other uh, colleagues, um, men as well, to be part of this discussion. Um, but I thank you for sharing your inspiration and also sharing your personal experiences as well. Um, it uh, takes a certain strength to do that, uh, especially in big audiences, and, and really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone who's joined both at the seminar room at the Kirby Institute and all of our uh, people who've joined online. It's It's been a great experience. Thanks, everybody.